God bless you, Dawson family. And to those of you who've tuned online, again, God richly bless you. Very interesting subject today in our encouragement of your faith. <laughs> A running tip, here it is. Watch what you eat. Watch what you eat. Now, we're not going to be talking about, uh, you know, should you go on a, a diet to get leaner? We're not going to be talking about uh, whether you have the, the privilege of eating three slices of chocolate cake. No, don't, don't get the wrong idea here. It's the idea that, that we need to, spiritually speaking, eat the right stuff if we're going to walk in a way that would please our Lord Jesus Christ. We're on a journey. We're on a run. We're in a marathon. Our goal line, one day we will be with Jesus. One day we will be with God. And we want to run successfully and well and joyously in this race. So watch what you eat. Watch what you eat. And we're going to come, ac uh, come across some, some surprising truths in the scriptures today. And so I trust it will be a, a huge encouragement to you in the name of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, grant great grace to us. May what we really want is your grace to be filled with Jesus, and I pray that you would give us understanding and grace as we walk through these scriptures in Jesus' name, amen, amen. In 1965, a team of researchers in the University of Florida, down in the United States, came up with a formula to help elite athletes um, in their vigorous exertion in sports, particularly the football team. Uh, during the, especially the hot weather, they would sweat a lot. And not only would they be drained of fluids, but of course, the sweat also contained things like salt and electrolytes and so on. And some of the athletes would get cramps and uh, feel a, a tremendous amount of fatigue near the end of the game. And so they wanted a sports drink that would be able to replenish some of those electrolytes and some of that energy that these athletes were losing in these big games. And so these uh, researchers... Um, led by Dr. Robert Cade, came up with a formula. It had, of course, water, but then things like uh, sodium, salt, potassium, um, uh, lemon juice, uh, those kind of things to help, uh, and, and sugar, to help replenish the energy and electrolytes and the hydration of athletes. Um, a, couple of years, a couple of years later, 1967, the University of Florida, their football team, the Gators, uh, Florida Alligators. Uh, Florida is known for its alligators, so they call themselves the, the Florida Gators. That's why it's called Gatorade. Uh, they won the football tournament, the Rose Bowl, over the University of Georgia. And some of the athletes were asked, like, how did you have so much energy? How did you win? Well, it's some of the athletes attributed to this Gatorade that they drank at halftime that replenished their electrolytes and their hydration and all of that kind of thing. The opposing coach, uh, the coach of the, um, uh, the University of Georgia, the Yellow Jackets, uh, was asked, well, why'd you lose the game? And he said, we didn't have Gatorade. We didn't have Gatorade. You see, elite athletes know that it's important, they, they, they need to be careful what they put in their bodies. Now, when we're young, we think we can eat anything. Um, when I was young, I had two hollow legs. That's what my mom used to say. That's what, my, what folks would say. I mean, we could just eat anything and everything, and it didn't seem to affect us a whole lot, except that we were, it seemed like we were always hungry. But you know, as we get older, we elite athletes are aware that it's very important what we are putting into our bodies. Um, it's, it's interesting, even spiritually speaking, there is a stream in Christendom among the Christian community that it's still important what you eat because what you eat does affect your relationship with God. And I want you to say, no, no. As a matter of fact, it's not me saying this, it's God saying this. No, what you eat does not affect your relationship with God. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, uh, whether you have it electronically or hard copy, it's near the end of your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 13. And this chapter is really about a bunch of running tips. It's like our biblical coach by the Holy Spirit has come alongside us and is helping us to run this race and giving us little tidbits of good information to help us to run more successfully, a little easier, a little more joyously, this race uh, towards our glory line and our goal line. And, and so we've, we've looked at things like, like, relax, be content, because God is with you. 
Um, you don't need to reinvent faith. There's folks who have gone ahead and, um, and they've pleased God. Follow their example because, listen to this, Jesus Christ is, a, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We may need to reinvent how we use our phones over the generations, but our faith, no, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so look at the examples of Scripture. They will help you in your walk with Jesus. Now, in verse 9 and 10, we have a very interesting thought here. And it's, if I were to title this, it's, well, I did, I did title it. It's running tip, running tip. Watch what you eat. Watch what you eat. Here's what it says here in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9 and 10. It says this, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings, it is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. In other words, he's saying, watch what you eat, watch what you eat. Now, of course, he's not talking about physical food. Now, there is a segment in even our Christian circles that says it's very important that you uh, you eat properly. If you really want to please God, you've got to have the right diet. So some have espoused a kind of a vegan diet versus uh, sort of a meat diet and that kind of thing. Some have gone back to the Old Testament and said, well, we need to eat just clean food rather than unclean food and so on. And the writer here of Hebrews says, no, 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 no. That's not what the scriptures are saying. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4 would actually say that we need to understand what the scripture says about food. Listen to this, listen to this. This is important. This is important. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and let me read the first few, four or five verses. It says this. The Spirit clearly says that in the later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Taught by demons. Listen to this. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron, this is the teaching of demons. Listen to this. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. In other words, you can eat whatever you want <laughs> Because God gave it to you to enjoy, and, um, and, and, and as long as you give thanks to God for it, it is consecrated to you. It is good for those who belong to God to enjoy all these different kinds of foods. Now, some of you will say, yeah, but doesn't the Old Testament talk about there are certain clean foods and unclean foods and so on? And that there's some foods that we should, as Christians, avoid and some foods that we should partake of? Well, I think to help us understand this, let me give you a little bit of a timeline concerning uh, the privileges of, or the, um, the permissions to eat certain kinds of foods. Now, I'd have to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, God has created people, and in Genesis chapter 1, God has said this. In uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. So we can eat um, strawberries, blueberries, um, apples, oranges, pears, tangerines, etc., 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 whatever is there. Uh, enjoy it. Enjoy it. Uh, it was interesting to note that after the flood, after the flood in Genesis chapter 9, God exp expanded that dietary permission to include everything, everything. Um, after the, as, as you know, the people in the earth sinned and God flooded the earth and only those who would by faith enter the ark were saved. Um, just that's a beautiful picture of the fact that those who put their faith and trust in Jesus, will be saved. That's an Old Testament. The, the, the idea of the ark is an Old Testament picture of that. Uh, so Genesis chapter 9, they're coming out of the ark, and God is saying that, that, um, that now you can, I'm going to give you this kind of food here. He says this, um, 
everything that lives and moves about, this is Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. So they are allowed to eat everything, everything, everything that moves, including all the green plants and all that moves, they can eat. Um, well, then we come to a period of time where God gives a covenant. We call it the Old Testament covenant. Um, it is based on the Ten Commandments. And God has drawn a nation to himself and entered into a special relationship with them because, well, there's a number of reasons. Number one, to bring the Savior into the earth and to make it abundantly clear that he is the Savior and to also to teach people that they need a Savior, to teach the whole world they need a Savior, and that only those who are actually God's people will be saved as they put their trust in the Savior who will save them from their sins. And so to help the world know that these people are very special and belong to Him, God gave them extra regulations so that the world would know that these are a very special people. So there were rules about you know, what you could wear, um, what you could eat, um, the, the, um, um, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there was just all sorts of rules for all sorts of things. And it was very clear to the people of the world, these are the Jewish people who have put their trust in the one and living God. And they are, and you can tell by what they eat. Um, the, the Leviticus chapter 11 gives us a list of all the clean foods that they could eat. Um, they were certain re restrictions on their haircuts, on their clothing and that kind of stuff. But food, particularly, I mean, clean food, clean food. It had to, had to chew the cud and have a split hoop. So you could eat cow, but you couldn't eat a horse. Um, you could eat uh, deer, but you couldn't eat a rabbit. Uh, you could eat fish, but you couldn't eat a shark. You could eat uh, uh, your trout uh, or your salmon, but you couldn't eat shrimp or, or lobster and, and, that, and th those kind of things. And I, I mean, sometimes we've tried to sort of figure out, like, is there a scientific reason for all of this? But when it really boils down to it is God has said, this is what I want you to do to show that you are my people. I am the holy God, and I want you to be set apart holy for me. And that was a that was now a teaching time that would last generations for the people of God to realize that they needed to turn to God, not just in their day-to-day -day lives, but for their eternal future as well. And so that would all be in place until the coming of the one who would be the Savior. His name is Jesus. And Jesus would usher in a new covenant, a new agreement, a new relationship. So, for instance, in Mark chapter 7, now as we move now into the, the New Testament, the New Testament uh, consideration, Mark chapter 7, very interesting chapter. The, um, the disciples are coming in and they want to eat some lunch. And uh, the religious leaders notice that the disciples didn't take the time to do a ceremonial hand cleansing uh, to begin to eat their food. And so now that they didn't have a ceremonial hand cleansing, I mean, I'm sure they washed all the crud off, but the, there was a prescribed way of washing the hands so that your food wouldn't be defiled. <laughs> and, and so the, the, the religious leaders knows that Jesus' disciples didn't do that. And so they're accusing Jesus of, of really of sin, that he was allowing his disciples to eat with unclean hands. Jesus would have some very sharp rebuke uh, for these religious leaders. And then he would turn to the crowd in Mark chapter 7. He would say this, uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, L un and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles him. Now... <laughs> The disciples come to him in the house a little bit later on. They say, we didn't quite get this. Jesus says to them, are you so dull? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, into their mind, and into their, their walk with God. No, it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In other words, it goes in, and it goes through, and it out comes out the back, the back end, right? <laughs> now, it's very interesting. The Holy Spirit had Mark pen in these words. In saying this, 
Jesus declared all foods clean. Because Jesus was taking them into a new covenant, a new agreement. Because the Old Testament was to lead the people of God and indeed the entire world to the one and only Savior. And now the Savior has come, the old rules and regulations would be done with, and now we have the freedom of focusing our attention on Jesus and on Jesus alone, alone. Now the disciples should have got this, the disciples should have got this, especially the leader of the disciples, if we could say it, put it that way, um, the Apostle Peter. A couple of years later, Peter, who was <laughs> known to be a bit of a dozer, he would, he would doze off at times. I mean, he dozed off at the Mount of Transfiguration. He dozed off in the Garden of Gethsemane. He dozed off the night, uh, the night uh, just before he was to be executed the next day. I mean, he didn't have a problem sleeping. Um, and it sounds like that in Acts chapter 10, he was again uh, dozing. Now, he's actually gone up to the, the, the rooftop to pray uh, as he's waiting for dinner. And, but then as he's kind of praying and kind of dozing off in the heat of the day, he enters into a trance and he sees this vision that God gives him. And in this vision, there's a, a, she a sheet. Uh, it's like a, a bed sheet coming down out of heaven with all sorts of animals in it, like every kind of animal, not just clean animals, according to Jewish custom, but all sorts of animals. And he heard a voice coming out of heaven, get up, Peter, kill and eat. You know what he says? Surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Now, what? Now, my, my, Peter, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. Didn't you hear what Jesus said in Mark chapter 7? that the new covenant means that, there is, that all foods are now clean. We're going to pre-Old um, Testament, the days of Noah, even through the days of creation, all foods are now clean. Peter, didn't you get this? Didn't you get this? Oh, Lord, I've never eaten anything. I can't, I can't get up and eat all the stuff that's on this bed sheet. No way. No way. Um, God's answer, the answer that he heard of the voice do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Jesus had declared all foods clean. So there's no way that Peter should have said, oh, I can't eat this. Well, he didn't just see this dream once, this vision once, twice, three times, three times. And when he finally finishes it the third time, there's actually a knock on the door downstairs and there's some men looking for Peter. And Peter needs to go to some Gentiles, whom the Jews felt that, were, uh, felt that they were unclean. As a matter of fact, there was the feeling there that if the Gentiles were actually to receive salvation, they would need to become Jewish. Peter needed to realize, and he should have known that theologically, that all foods are now clean. But the, part of the reason why God gave him this dream was that Peter should have realized that, that you don't need to become Jewish to be saved. No, all eyes, Jewish. Gentile, clean, unclean, put your eyes on Jesus, receive Jesus who died on the cross for your sins and you will be saved. Hallelujah, praise God. Peter had to learn that the hard way. So now as we get into the epistles, of course, there are some instructions. Food is just food. Food is just food. I mean, we've got that amazing verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 that says this, food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. It's not about physical food. As a matter of fact, even if the food has been offered to demons in sacrifice, if that same sacrifice is then brought to the common market and offered at discount price, and you want to buy that because you want some discount meat, that's, well, yeah, it might have been offered to a demon. Um, it's, it's okay because it's just food. Paul's reasoning was, what's an idol? There are nothing anyways. So if you're a Christian, you can eat anything you want. Now, but on the other hand, if that offends uh, the person with you and they get all upset because you're eating food that's been, you know, given to a demon, well, then don't eat it. Don't let your freedom become a stumbling block to someone else. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 14, uh, the Apostle Paul would say this, except the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. 
One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. So uh, don't, don't let your freedom become a stumbling block so you can eat anything. <laughs> don't, you know, don't throw it in the face of somebody that's just a vegan because they think that that's, that's the way to go. No, 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 no. That, then, then you just enjoy your vegan diet as well. And then when you're in the privacy in your own home, if you want to have steak sandwich, uh, you go for it, that kind of stuff. But, but, but we need to love each other, accept one another. But the principle here is that food doesn't help us to become more spiritual. It doesn't help us to become more spiritual. So now come back to Hebrews chapter 13 with me, and that's what the writer here is saying. Because as this as, our, as the writer of Hebrews chapter 13, it's almost like he's running along with us, okay? He's running beside us, and he's giving us these tips, and he's realizing that many of these, his co-runners, particularly in this epistle, they're Jewish. They're Jewish. And, you know, and when you've been doing something for so long, you feel like, um, well, you, you know, it's hard to change those things. You've only eaten clean food, and you've stayed away from unclean food, and you've stayed away from... Um, food that's been offered to idols and all that kind of stuff. And, the, and our writer has to say, look, it, it's not about food. It's not about food, physical food. And so he says this, do not be carried, this is uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. What I find really particularly interesting in that particular verse is that he calls it strange teachings. The word strange is the word xeno, X-E-N-O, xeno. Um, you may have maybe familiar with the term xenophobia, which is the phobia, the fear of the stranger. <laughs> my dog has a service, my son has a service dog, and... Uh, and uh, his, his dog, Rosebud, loves to be petted and that kind of stuff. And so every time Rosebud comes downstairs, and she wants to be petted and she's super hyper and that kind of stuff. My son would say, oh, stranger danger. There's dad, stranger danger. <laughs> We've used that phrase with our kids, stranger danger. That's the word here. It's stranger, stranger. And you got to look out for the stranger. Now, the interesting thing is that for the Jewish runners with the writer of Hebrews, I mean, those dietary laws aren't strange. But he says, but hold on, you're now in Christ. You're in Christ. You've accepted Jesus as your Savior and Lord. And so these old rules of you thinking that food makes you a better Christian, and whether you abstain or engage in those particular foods makes you better or worse, hey, no, no, for you who know Jesus... Hey, folks, that should be strange. That's stranger danger stuff. Yeah, you might be familiar with it, but now that you're a Christian, whoa, that's, no, that, that gets us off track. When my focus becomes now on my clothing and my haircut and my, and my, and my, and my, my diet, you know, I'm, I'm losing track of what it's all about. No, 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 no. That's strange teaching. Food doesn't bring you any closer to God. Let me read again uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. It says this, Food does not bring us near to God. We're no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. So what do we eat? What do we eat? Well, it's very interesting. Verse 10, if we can add this in here, we have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now, to the Jewish people that are running here in this race, they understand exactly what he's meaning. What, what, those who minister at the tabernacle, well, they would be the Levites and particularly the priests. And when a priest offered a sacrifice, usually he was allowed to eat of some of the sacrifices. As a matter of fact, there were some sacrifices that the people who were even offering the sacrifices couldn't eat, but the priest could eat. But the writer here says in verse 10, but you have food from the altar which these, these priests do not have a right to eat. Because what do we eat? Well, he's already mentioned it in verse 9. What do we eat? We eat grace. We eat grace. You see, the Old Testament priests, those who are serving at the tabernacle, those who are still under the Old Testament um, regime and administration, 
they have not embraced Jesus as Savior and Lord. They cannot, they think they can, but they cannot appreciate and appropriate the grace of God in their lives. They can't. Because now that Christ has died on the cross for our sins and rose again from the dead, the focus now is Jesus and Jesus alone. Wow. Wow. So it doesn't matter if you're a priest. It doesn't matter if you're a Levite. If you've not received Christ, you do not have the intimate, eternal grace of God in, uh, in, uh, operative in your life. That grace is amazing. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's favor on you. <laughs> grace means that I have assurance that my sins are forgiven. Grace teaches me to say no to unrighteousness and yes to righteousness and holiness. That's what grace does. Grace, grace allows me to experience the smile of God. That's why even in the Old Testament, it, the priest would give that wonderful benediction, but now it's in Christ. It's in Christ. And so the Lord make his... The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and grant you his peace. And now under the, the New Testament, we say, and in Jesus' name, amen, amen. That, that, the face of God shine on you. The face of God turning towards you. His smile, that's what we eat. That's what we eat, the grace of God. Of God. There's a remarkable passage in the New Testament. <laughs> uh, John chapter 6, really quite intriguing, really quite intriguing. And sometimes as we read it, just sort of uh, without the emotional context and the, uh, the, the context there in John chapter 6, we kind of miss it. Uh, we miss it. I, I mean, Jesus already talked about what the real food is, that grace. He's already said to his disciples when he was dealing with the woman at the well, he says that uh, I have food that you don't know what that, I mean, they said to him, you know, eat, master, eat. Um, and he said to them, oh, I have food that you don't, you don't know anything about. And his disciples in John chapter 4, verse 33, could someone have brought him food? And Jesus would say this, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. See, that's genuine food. That's grace. That's grace. John chapter 6, though, very incredible passage. The people have been with Jesus all day. Jesus then tells his disciples, you give them something to eat. They don't have enough money, or at least if they did have the money, it would just cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to feed this huge crowd. They've counted approximately 5,000 men plus women and children. So you're looking at a crowd of what if every man had a wife and maybe a kid or two, you're looking at a crowd of like 20,000 people. Where are, we, where are we going to get food like this? <laughs> One of the disciples come up to Jesus and said, well, I found a boy's lunch. It's the only food in the crowd. Five little barley loaves and uh, you know, sort of five buns of bread and two little fish to add to the, 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 the bread for a bit of a boy's lunch. That's all we could find. And Jesus had them, the disciples, arrange the folks in crowds of 50s and 100s and he took that boy's lunch and he gave thanks to the father for it. And then he broke it up into pieces, gave it to his disciples, and they began to distribute. And the, the, the bread and the fish, they just kept on multiplying, multiplying, multiplying. I mean, they would take a bite out of the basket. And there was still a pile underneath the basket, in the bottom of the basket. And they would take some more. You know, and, and the Bible says in all of the Gospels that the crowd was satisfied. It was, they were satisfied they were satisfied. They were filled. So if they were kind of concerned about, you know, this little boy's lunch and, you know, well, I need to leave some for my, the, next, the next part. Well, the disciples made sure that the, the plate went around the second and third and fourth time until everyone was what satisfied. It was, it was the largest or the most seen miracle in the, the entire ministry of Jesus. That's why this one miracle is quoted by all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it's very interesting, though. It's the Gospel of John that records the conversation that Jesus had with the crowd the following day. You see, after the crowd had their fill of this amazing lunch, Jesus dismissed them, 
had a prayer meeting at, that, uh, that night and then, or that evening. And then the next day, the, the crowd went around the lake and found Jesus. And you know what they wanted, right? You know exactly what they wanted. They wanted another meal. Um, and um, Jesus said, you're, you're looking for the wrong kind of food. You're looking for the wrong kind of food. Well, what should we do? What, do, what is it that God wants? Well, the work of God is this, to believe in the one who has sent me. Well, if we're going to believe in you, then do a miracle. Jesus had just done the miracle yesterday. <laughs> what do you mean? I need to do another miracle, if I could sort of paraphrase my thinking in that, that story. Like, what do you mean he has to do another miracle? He just did a miracle. For, but you see, they want, oh, we got one free lunch. This, this should be like every day, just like back in, well, back in Moses' day, when every day they had fresh manna, right? Fresh bread from heaven. It's very interesting as we go through this amazing discussion that Jesus has with these people, he makes it very clear, I am the bread from heaven. I am the bread from heaven. Um, I am, verse 51, for instance, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Now, verse 52, very interesting verse, says, And the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? We're not cannibals. We don't eat human flesh. But that was their excuse. Now, folks, we need to understand this. The Jews understood what Jesus was saying. If he is the bread from heaven, you need to eat me. And the Jewish people understood. Now, we Christians have added another whole layer to this. Well, we eat Jesus by, you know, we, when we have the Lord's table, we take the bread, it's a symbol of the body of Jesus. We take the cup, it's a symbol of his blood. And we, so in that way, we eat Jesus. No, Jesus was referring to that. The Jewish people knew they just didn't want to accept that what they wanted was a free meal every day. They didn't want to accept that Jesus is the bread from heaven. No, Jesus, give us fresh bread every day miraculously. We don't have to work for it anymore. They understood that. And we need to understand that in this passage. They knew what Jesus was saying. Oh, but there was, oh, no, he wants us to eat him. No, no, no. Yeah, I, you, you need to eat Jesus. What, what, what do we mean by that? Well, just like when you eat food, that food becomes the energy that gets you going. It's the life of Jesus that gets us going. Amen? Isn't that right? I don't physically eat Jesus, but I take Jesus as my source of life and energy and nourishment. His life becomes my life. The Jewish people knew it, but they wanted to argue the point because they wanted a free meal. And Jesus makes it abundantly clear, abundantly, abundantly clear. And he says this, um, he, he would go on to say, whoever eats my flesh, uh, actually, let me back it up a verse here. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his pl blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It's clear. It's clear. It's not a matter about eating physically Jesus. It is the spiritually taking on the life of Jesus as my own. He moves me. He's the source of my spiritual life. My walk with God is centered on Christ. So when our writer in Hebrews tells us we need to watch what we eat, folks, it's not about physical food. It really isn't. It's about this. Eat grace. Eat Jesus. He's real food. So as you run this journey, as you run this journey, the Old Testament way only points to this, but it's not the answer to our spiritual walk. No, it's all about Christ. Even Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17 says, those were just a shadow, just a shadow. The reality is Christ. So watch what you eat. Eat what? Grace, grace, the favor of God. Eat Jesus 
And God bless you as we run together in His strength, His energy, His life. Amen.